All right, we'll get started to try and stay on time, and hopefully a few more people will join us. Um, so the talk, uh, that, or the title of this is Integrating Care for Oncology Patients, Establishing a Multidisciplinary Oncology Clinic with Advanced Therapeutics. And our, cat, our uh, course faculty, uh, we're excited to have Alicia Morgan. So she's an associate professor of medicine at Northwestern. Uh, Kelvin Moses, who will be joining us soon, he was at his plenary session, is an associate professor of urology at Vanderbilt and is the head of their multidisciplinary prostate cancer clinic. And then Brian Shook, who's an associate professor and the director of, at the UCLA Kidney Cancer Program. Myself, I'm Kelly Stratton. I'm an assistant professor at, at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm the head of the urologic oncology clinic there, which is a multidisciplinary clinic. Um, so just as an introduction to multidisciplinary care for in the oncology setting, uh, I have no uh, relevant disclosures to this talk, but I have several listed here. Uh, we will be using the audience response system, so if you're able to uh, get that on your phone, you can respond to the uh, questions that we have. And so basically you just open up the app, you find the course, and then uh, we'll have a series of questions, and then you can respond to those. And uh, if you don't have the app, then you can just kind of um, play along or uh, make comments. So the first question is, uh, what is everybody's specialty? Uh, this uh, course is intended for uh, several different uh, specialty groups, uh, urologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and also specifically advanced practice providers, so people who may be working in any of those clinics uh, as, as a uh, potential target audience as well. And then other, so if anybody has the app and are able to respond. A is urologist, B medical oncologist, C radiation oncologist, D advanced practice provider, and then E is other. We have, so two urologists, that's perfect. Uh, this is definitely a course that is designed for the urologist in mind. Uh, and then uh, any other specialty, in, far as the multidisciplinary setting. Uh, does anybody currently work in a multidisciplinary setting? A would be yes, B would be no, C would be no, but trying to create a multidisciplinary clinic. One no and one no, but trying to set one up. So that, this will be very helpful, and hopefully we encourage you, uh, even if you're not in a multidisciplinary setting, to explore it as an option. And then lastly, uh, what challenges do you see as far as creating a multidisciplinary clinic? Uh, a would be funding or finding members who have a shared interest. B, limited time to start a multidisciplinary clinic. C, uncertain of the benefit of a multidisciplinary clinic. D, worried about the cost of a multidisciplinary clinic or E, other or none. All right. Yeah, finding members uh, with a shared interest in multidisciplinary care can be a struggle, and oftentimes finding somebody who's willing to commit the time and effort is really one of the principal uh, challenges to starting a multidisciplinary clinic. So these are our objectives for this introduction. And, and really the genesis of this course uh, comes about from uh, the renewed uh, 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 effort to try and create a multidisciplinary setting for cancer care. In 2017, the ASCO State of Cancer Care in America uh, reported that uh, delivering a coordinated multidisciplinary patient-centered uh, cancer care program is one of the principal challenges for oncologists around the country. And this is in the face of uh, reduced reimbursement, increased demands on seeing patients, personalized medicine, uh, increasingly elaborate treatment plans. And so the, the uh, benefit of multidisciplinary care we hope will increase over time as well as the interest in multidisciplinary care. Uh, MDC uh, clinics have been recognized as markers of uh, improved outcomes, and so 
health uh, care organizations and governments across the country and across the world have recognized multidisciplinary care as an important marker of quality care. And in fact, several countries like United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia have specifically mandated multidisciplinary cancer care as a guideline for anyone who's considering treatment of cancer patients. And some countries like France, Britain, or sorry, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands have it literally as a, as a law. It's in place as a law. Unfortunately, there are barriers to multidisciplinary care, and the urologist specifically is somebody as a gatekeeper who may be able to influence and impact the multidisciplinary team. This is a study out of Australia, one of those countries that mandates multidisciplinary care, which showed that urology had some of the lowest levels of engagement in a multidisciplinary setting, and that even after they tried to enhance multidisciplinary engagement, the urologists were resistant. Ironically, when you look in the data, uh, many of these patients had advanced prostate cancer or even metastatic disease, and they still weren't engaged in multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, we do see that uh, multidisciplinary recommendations are not always predictable. So for the clinician who feels like, well, I don't need to send that patient to a multidisciplinary clinic because I already know what they're going to say, that's not always true. So. This study looked at 312 urology patients who were referred to a multidisciplinary clinic, and almost 20% had a recommendation for treatment that the initial provider couldn't predict. And so um, it's really important to not feel like you have all the answers and to understand and appreciate the benefits of a multidisciplinary setting. And some of these patients uh, had even localized disease who, uh, after the multidisciplinary review, the treatment plan changed. The other thing is that a significant number of them were referred for a clinical trial that otherwise the uh, initial provider wasn't considering. It's important to consider that urologists are a central role and a central member of a multidisciplinary team. We participate in many, uh, in many activities that will lead to a patient's diagnosis, like PSA screening, cystoscopy, urography, we also are actively engaged in treatment, like active surveillance or surgery, intravesical therapies, and we, we provide survivorship as well. So all those things combine to help us channel patients into the multidisciplinary setting. There are other com uh, components of a multidisciplinary team, obviously, like a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, and even primary care providers. There are also supportive services like pharmacists, nutritionalists, pain management, and patient navigators, which can be critical to the engagement in a multidisciplinary team. And then you can have radiologists and pathologists as well. So this diagram is just outlining a multidisciplinary approach to improving radium usage in patients with advanced prostate cancer. And you can see there are multiple different components to that structure. So a multidisciplinary clinic has several different uh, potential uh, structures. You can have an all-in-one approach where everybody participates in the same clinical space, and a patient just sees one provider after another, or you can even have virtual clinics where each provider is in a separate location, but patients then move from one space to the other. Tumor boards can be a great way to centralize that and make sure that a patient doesn't get lost. And patient navigators can be critical for that as well. So here are a couple of diagrams that outline a multidisciplinary clinical approach. On the left is just a schematic of a patient who comes into a multidisciplinary clinic and then can be sent to each specialist individually or collectively. On the right is the Jefferson approach to prostate cancer uh, clinic. So they have a very intricate uh, clinical structure for their multidisciplinary clinic. Here is a, a diagram of Walter Reed's multidisciplinary prostate cancer clinic. This may not be applicable to many sites because of its overwhelming structure and requirement for additional support, but you can see where as patients come in each day, they have an assignment for who they're going to talk to and in which order, and ultimately at the end of the day, they've had a complete multidisciplinary review and then have a treatment plan in place. Here's a schematic of a virtual clinic where a patient may be seen by a urologist, and then depending upon what their clinical features are and even the uh, results of a tumor board review, they can be referred out to a medical oncologist or a radiation oncologist as needed. Importantly, all of this care, it's very difficult for an individual cancer provider to offer this, and so 
uh, understanding that advanced practice providers can really help us uh, create that multidisciplinary atmosphere is important. And uh, so advanced practice providers have been important in providing, for instance, uh, medical management, wound care, pain management, and even collaboration with primary care providers. In the recent ASCO survey uh, in their census, they found that 75% of oncologists are employing advanced practice providers in their practice. And when you look at surgical oncologists, up to 85% of them have advanced practice providers, and specifically those providers can either work in, um, in parallel with the surgeon or on their own. And so uh, those are two critical uh, options that can, can really help with a multidisciplinary clinic. So in conclusion, urologists remain central <coughs> figures in uh, ur urologic cancer care. Uh, we're going to be the gatekeepers to these patients. Considering and using a multidisciplinary clinic can really help improve patient outcomes and uh, is a marker of quality. And as we uh, will see in these upcoming talks, the increasingly complex therapeutic landscape is really going to necessitate a multidisciplinary approach. So that's very important. The incorporation of advanced practice providers can really help with the overwhelming burden that we see clinically. And so incorporating them into your plan for a multidisciplinary clinic can be very helpful. So now we'll move on to our next speaker. And this is Alicia Morgan. She'll be talking about advanced prostate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for the invitation um, and for putting this together. And thank you guys for coming. Uh, we will be talking about advanced prostate cancer, which is uh, the area where I do most of my work. Um, and how we can think about working together because I think although the urologist is really a central figure in all of this and that I hope to make very clear, I think other providers as we just heard, um, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists and prostate cancer can be really, really important and these advanced practice providers can also be um, really integral to making sure that the transitions between different providers and the communication is clear. These are my disclosures and I don't believe there's anything relevant but there they are. Uh, so we'll go through metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer first, talking about systemic therapy advances as well as the question about radiating the primary, um, because I think those are really uh, key parts of multidisciplinary care currently in, in advanced disease. Then the uh, M0, castration resistant prostate cancer space, where transitions between urology and medical oncology and collaboration can be critical. Complications of ADT and thinking specifically about bone health and how that can be a collaborative environment for multidisciplinary care. And then thinking through personalization with genetic testing as well um, and in a multidisciplinary kind of a setting. So starting again with metastatic hormone sensitive disease, I think we're all very familiar that the last few years, starting with the CHARTIS study in around 2014, 2015, have really evolved when it comes to systemic therapy in metastatic hormone sensitive disease. And the CHARTIS uh, study looked at the combination of docetaxel times six with ADT and compared that to ADT alone, looking at overall survival in men with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, we found that there was an improvement in overall survival, which I think really highlighted an area that had been traditionally um, sort of uh, dominated by urologists alone identifying patients with new metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and identifying an area where we may need to have some collaboration with medical oncologists. Importantly, the survival benefit of docetaxel or chemohormonal therapy as opposed to ADT alone was demonstrated again in a follow-up, uh, longer-term follow-up data that was also published more recently on the charted patient population. But it really identified that the benefit to chemohormonal therapy seemed to be predominantly in the high-volume metastatic patient population as compared to the low-volume metastatic population. So high-volume disease, as we all remember, is at visceral disease, visceral metastases, or at least four bone metastases with at least one outside of the axial skeleton. And those are the patients who seem to benefit from this combination with chemotherapy, really an opportunity for multidisciplinary care because medical oncologists are traditionally the, the folks who will give the docetaxel in this setting. 
This was corroborated by evidence from the Stampede study, which also looked at a metastatic hormone-sensitive patient population. Unfortunately, the Stampede study did not show us any information about high and low volume disease, but what it does show in this survival curve is that when we look at the whole population, and this is metastatic hormone-sensitive patients who could be de novo metastatic or recurrent after localized therapy, as well as high-risk localized patients who have a rising PSA, there was an overall survival benefit, again, associated with the addition of docetaxel in this population. Um, we are still waiting for the Stampede folks to give us more information about whether this benefit holds up when they look at their patients by high and low volume disease, and we expect that information within the next year, so that will be really helpful and something that urologists and medical oncologists can work around in a multidisciplinary type of a conversation for each patient to think about whether adding docetaxel to their ADT is going to be beneficial. We also have to think about abiraterone. So this systemic therapy landscape for metastatic hormone sensitive disease is pretty complex and is becoming increasingly so. So the, this is the latitude trial, which identified men who had de novo metastatic hormone sensitive disease, here's the schema, and randomized those patients to receive either ADT plus abiraterone or ADT alone. They followed them for overall survival as well as a number of secondary endpoints and found that there was longer overall survival with the combination of abiraterone with ADT as compared to ADT alone. Importantly, this was a de novo metastatic disease population and it was one that was identified as having high risk disease by these criteria here. So you had to have at least two of three of the following. So Gleason score greater than or equal to eight, at least three bone lesions on bone scan, or the presence of visceral metastatic disease. So again, identifying this high risk population. Stampede, uh, and here is the survival curve that demonstrated the benefit with abiraterone in addition to ADT versus ADT alone. Abiraterone is the curve on the top there. You can see nearly a 40% reduction in mortality. Stampede also added to this literature, uh, and this study, again, is including metastatic hormone sensitive disease that was de novo metastatic or recurrent metastatic disease, and it also could include this high-risk localized disease with a rising PSA, so sort of a hodgepodge population. They randomized patients to receive ADT plus abiraterone or ADT alone and found, again, that there was a survival adva advantage, nearly a 40% reduction in mortality associated with the combination of ADT and abiraterone. So systemic therapy becoming more complex, uh, and these conversations between medical oncologists and urologists, I think, really becoming imperative. There is no data to tell us whether we should use abiraterone or chemohormonal therapy in the high-risk patient population specifically, though the Stampede study does give us some insight, a little bit of insight, into whether we should use one or the other. So this is not a pre-planned study, but patients were randomized simultaneously to receive chemohormonal therapy or abiraterone uh, in addition to ADT. So these arms on the stampede trial were accruing simultaneously. Just about 560 patients, so, so 566 patients were randomized during that time, this overlapping period of enrollment. And uh, these patients were assessed for death from any cause. And this was not a formally powered upfront comparison, but in this analysis, these two arms of simultaneously enrolling patients on chemohormonal therapy or abiraterone and ADT were compared in a post hoc analysis. And there was no advantage in terms of overall survival or prostate cancer specific survival to treatment with chemohormonal therapy or abiraterone and ADT in the overall population. So here you can see the survival curve, looking at standard of care ADT plus docetaxel or chemohormonal therapy in the red curve, and ADT plus abiraterone in the blue curve, and they're completely overlapping. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of the overall survival endpoint. Prostate cancer specific survival also, there was no significant benefit. As you can imagine, there was a benefit to PSA relapse in the ADT plus abiraterone arm. Um, versus the, the six cycles of chemohormonal therapy, but that did not translate into survival, whether it's overall or prostate cancer specific. The landscape is becoming more complex, however, because we have the, uh, the ARCHES trial as well, looking at metastatic hormone sensitive disease and randomizing these patients to receive ADT plus enzalutamide or ADT alone, and this was just presented at GUASCO. The primary endpoint of the study was radiographic progression-free survival. That's what was reported. We do not have survival benefit uh, at this point. But ADT plus enzalutamide was associated with a significantly prolonged 
radiographic progression-free survival as compared to ADT alone. So enzalutamide uh, is being considered, I'm not sure where it stands in the regulatory process at this point, but the company is considering putting in a, an, an approval for expanded indication in the metastatic hormone sensitive space. This is the overall survival curve. This is very immature data, so they don't have enough events to adequately compare survival in the ADT alone versus ADT plus enzalutamide arms, um, but this is continuing to mature. They need many hundreds of events left or more in order to really look at that comparison. In addition to systemic therapy becoming more complicated in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, we also have information from the Stampede study thinking about treating the primary with radiation. So another opportunity for multidisciplinary care. So for patients who had newly diagnosed uh, metastatic prostate cancer, patients were randomized to receive either ADT with or without docetaxel versus ADT with or with, without docetaxel plus radiation of the primary tumor. And they were followed as an overall population for overall survival. When we look at the overall survival for the entire population randomized, you can see that there is no benefit to radiating the primary in the overall population. But when the population was broken down into low volume metastatic disease, as per the charted criteria on the left, versus high burden metastatic disease, again per charted criteria on the right, there is no benefit to radiating the primary in the high burden or high volume disease population, but for the low volume, population, there was a significant improvement in survival associated with radiating the primary prostate. So again, an opportunity to involve uh, multidisciplinary care in thinking about treatment of the primary. Certainly there are a lot of clinical trials going on in the metastatic hormone sensitive space as well, so another opportunity to really collaborate in a multidisciplinary team. But because metastatic hormone sensitive disease includes multiple choices for combination systemic therapy, I think it's a great opportunity for collaboration. High volume disease patients may consider docetaxel to use um, when that they, they are uh, facing a high volume patient. Um, and you can have fewer cycles of disease and maybe good disease control with six cycles and done, as many, as many people say. And many patients like to continue, um, certainly would continue ADT, but like to get rid of that more intensive systemic therapy after a briefer period of time. For patients who have low volume disease or high volume disease or high risk disease, they can receive treatment with ADT and abiraterone and get an opportunity for a multidisciplinary discussion to figure out which is the best systemic therapy for your patients. And soon we may have enzalutamide in this setting as well. Treatment of the primary in the low volume setting uh, low volume metastatic hormone sensitive setting should be considered and is an opportunity to consider that conversation with the radiation oncologist and medical oncologist as a urologist would do. Um, and as I said, multiple clinical trials really helping to guide personalized choices for our patients, I think, um, really does require that cross discipline conversation. So the metastatic or non metastatic, rather, CRPC setting is another opportunity for collaboration. And this really revolves, in my opinion, around patient selection and identifying the highest risk patients who may benefit from intensive systemic therapy. So we know in general, in the hormone sensitive, non-metastatic, biochemical recurrent setting with a rising PSA, it's important to think about which patients actually need to be treated with ADT versus which patients can be monitored without, without us expecting for them to develop metastatic disease or to die from their prostate cancer. Some of the best data comes from a retrospective cohort study of just under 400 men um, by Steve Freeland and his group. These men developed biochemical recurrence after prostatectomy, and when he evaluated them by PSA doubling time, he and the group found that for those patients who had a PSA doubling time of greater than or equal to 15 months, there was significantly lower uh, prostate cancer-specific mortality when, when they were followed versus those patients who had a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to three months. So if we look at this, you could see that with each incremental shortening of the PSA doubling time, the risk of dying from prostate cancer would go up. Separate data in a non-metastatic CRPC setting, denosumab trial in the non-metastatic CRPC setting found that patients also had this, these patients also had this close association between shortened PSA doubling time and increased risk of metastatic disease. You can see an inflection point somewhere around nine months there. So how does this translate into multidisciplinary management of, of, of non-metastatic disease? Well, first, the urologist is also often going to be making those choices about when to initiate ADT. Um, but when the PSA starts to rise in the setting of ADT and the patient is 
Now, castration resistant, but scans suggest that there's no evidence of metastatic disease on traditional scans. There are other treatment oppor op opportunities for these patients. So the PROSPER trial, which was published about a year ago, included men with non-metastatic CRPC who had a PSA that was at least two and had a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. Men were randomized two to one to enzalutamide versus placebo and were followed for a novel endpoint, metastasis-free survival. So dying of their disease or, uh, or dying of any cause or developing met metastatic disease. You can see that enzalutamide, which is the line in blue, was associated with a significantly longer metastasis-free survival than patients treated with placebo, uh, really about 22-month prolongation of metastasis-free survival, so really striking, which led to the approval of enzalutamide in the non-metastatic CRPC space. Apalutamide was studied in the Spartan trial, very similar patient population, though this uh, group of patients may have had small uh, pelvic lymph nodes up to two centimeters, less than or equal to two centimeters, and the patients were randomized two to one to apalutamide versus placebo, followed again for this metastasis-free survival endpoint. Again, PSA had to be at least two, and they had to have a doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months significantly prolonged metastasis-free survival associated with apalutamide as compared to placebo, which led to the approval of apalutamide in this setting. Becoming more complicated, however, the Aramis study was recently reported. Um, this looked at darolutamide in the same patient population. Again, non-metastatic CRPC, short PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months, followed, again, for metastasis-free survival. And you could see there was a um, significantly prolonged metastasis-free survival associated with darolutamide as compared to placebo here. So how do we, how does this play into a multidisciplinary approach? This understanding of identifying patients who are developing non-metastatic CRPC I think is really critical. This is where APPs often come into play if they are following and monitoring your patients, if they're on uh, just standing uh, LHRH agonist therapy, for example, or antagonist therapy. When the PSA starts to rise, the APP can get, uh, or, or you certainly, can get scans to identify whether or not the patient is metastatic and collaborate with the medical oncologist um, regarding these treatments, adding enzalutamide, apalutamide, and potentially darolutamide in the future, or even discussing which one may be best for your patient. Certainly, you can identify those patients on your own and start those treatments on your own, but as the patient progresses and becomes metastatic CRPC, there's going to need to be a transition I would imagine, in most cases, to medical oncology. And so starting that transition or at least collaboration early can be very helpful so that the patients do not feel sort of blindsided and anxious as they finally meet the medical oncologist in the future. Um, so when I think about selection for starting ADT, certainly I try to start ADT in the in the hormone-sensitive biochemical recurrence space when the PSA doubling time is less than or equal to 10 months to really choose the right patient. And then when patients develop that non-metastatic CRPC, it's important to coordinate. And uh, uh, really that multidisciplinary approach can be very helpful. So bone health is also an opportunity for collaboration. We all know, if we're using ADT, that ADT exposure causes a decline in bone mineral density over time. And the longer you're on ADT, or if you've had an orchiectomy, the longer the time since orchiectomy, the greater the risk of developing fracture. So this uh, is, is not a, a new figure. This is a study that's been around since mid-2000s. Uh, so it was 2005. And those patients who were randomized, or these patients were just followed. It was a, um, a prospective analysis. Um, those patients who were receiving orchiectomy or who had prolonged GnRH agonist exposure um, had a significantly greater risk of fracture over time versus those patients who were not treated with ADT or did not receive prolonged GnRH agonist exposure. So this le led the NCCN and the National Osteoporosis Foundation uh, and other groups to comment that bone health is really critically important in our, our prostate cancer patients. For patients who have non-metastatic disease but are just receiving ADT, perhaps in the high-risk localized disease setting in, uh, in combination with radiation, for example, patients should uh, receive calcium and vitamin D supplementally, and they should be evaluated by multidisciplinary teams or team members who are specifically devoted to uh, identifying those patients at higher risk of developing fragility fractures. 
So additional pharmacologic therapy, whether that's zoledronic acid or denosumab, can be added when patients have a higher risk of fragility fractures. And the 10-year risk of a hip fracture would be greater than or equal to 3% or of major osteoporosis-related fracture of greater than or equal to 20%. And I'll show you in just a moment how that's calculated um, using a FRAX calculator. And a baseline bone mineral density test can be really important in helping to understand a patient's baseline risk as they're going into treatment. In the metastatic CRPC setting, bone health is also really important, both uh, to pre prevent fragility fracture, but also to really prevent skeletal-related events, which incorporates fragility fracture. So the development of a pathologic fracture or the need for surgery or radiation to bone or, or the development of cord compression. And this can be up to monthly zoledronic acid or denosumab. And we know from multiple settings that this is underutilized in the metastatic CRPC setting. So the FRAX calculator is what I mentioned to try to understand a patient's risk of developing fracture. Um, this was developed by the WHO and is um, really uh, tailored to an individual patient. So here you can see a screenshot of the calculator tool. This is the United States version. You can have this for any country where you're practicing. And you fill in specific information about the patient, including the bone mineral density score if you have that information, though the FRAX can run without a baseline DEXA score if you want. So the multidisciplinary comments that I have around bone health are that someone needs to own it. So whether that's an APP or a urologist in your practice, whether that's somebody in medical oncology, um, it, it doesn't matter as long as someone claims it and then someone makes sure that it's happening. Uh, and fragility fracture prevention for men on long-term ADT is really what's important there. That's longer than two years is really considered long-term ADT, and that's going to be different dosing than the, the symptomatic skeletal event dosing that's used in the metastatic CRPC setting. Uh, and you have to make sure that there's an approach to capturing these two separate populations and that that's, again, standardized in your practice so you don't miss the opportunity to intervene on these two settings. And finally, thinking about multidisciplinary collaboration around genetic testing, the guidelines have actually recently changed. These are the NCCN guidelines regarding recommendations for genetic testing for patients with prostate cancer. We know that uh, patients now who have metastatic disease, all of those patients are actually suggested to at least consider talking to a genetics counselor. And here's the, the screenshot from the guidelines, most recent guidelines here. So if metastatic disease, recommend consideration of talking to a genetic counselor, potentially uh, pre-testing uh, for germline mutations that could be driving that prostate cancer, and certainly post if there's a positive test. Um, and for high-risk localized patients as well who have a family history, genetic counseling is recommended, and that's been in integrated into the guidelines. How, does this how is this affected by multidisciplinary care? Well, again, similar to bone health, it's important to understand who owns genetic counseling and who owns genetic testing and those recommendations. Um, is there somebody, is there a genetic counselor in the practice who can help with these kinds of um, in implementation, implementing these sorts of recommendations? How does the workflow ensure that testing is occurring in appropriate patients? And is the testing approach different for localized versus metastatic patients? Because sometimes in the metastatic setting, we do germline testing when we're also testing the tumor in the setting of refractory um, patients becoming, or their disease becoming refractory to certain treatments. So when is the testing happening is the other question. Um, and where does the genetic counselor fit in? So briefly, we'll run through some cases. Um, a 57-year-old man who underwent a radical prostatectomy in 2012, high-risk disease, Gleason 9, um, T3B, he had adjuvant radiation for that, and his PSA became undetectable, but then began to rise. And this is a negative scan. I know it's going to be difficult to see back there. This is also a negative CT scan. So he initiated ADT for biochemical recurrence because he had a PSA doubling time that was less than three months. And his PSA became undetectable, but then again started to rise with a doubling time reaching three months by the MSKCC's calculator. And repeat scans, standard imaging, were negative. Um, so which of the following is most appropriate? And uh, if you could use your audience response, that would be great. Um, patients should undergo further imaging with a novel PET tracer. Do we have an audio audience response? Maybe we don't on this. Okay, if we could just raise hands. Who thinks? Yeah. Advance the slide? I'm sorry. That's the answer, though. Okay, so, um, so in the setting of non metastatic CRPC, the answer here is not that we should use bicalutamide. This is a change in practice. 
Um, enzalutamide or apalutamide should really be initiated. We do not need to do a novel PET tracer if it's not going to affect our clinical decision making. This patient's already had pelvic radiation in the, in the adjuvant setting, so we wouldn't need to think about that in the salvage setting. And ketoconazole, although an option, is not really um, the best option, I don't think, in this setting. So for case two, 67-year-old man with hypertension and some heart disease presented for after referral from his primary care doctor. He had an elevated PSA to 37. He had nocturia, low back pain, and some fatigue. His DRE was uh, was positive. He it was diffusely enlarged and firm prostate. He had a biopsy with Gleason grade group four um, or Gleason four plus four prostate cancer. He has definite uh, involvement on his bone scan, as you can see here, and even more clear involvement on his CT scan in the liver. So the most impro uh, appropriate option here, consider discussion in a multidisciplinary setting. He should have a liver biopsy to look for small cell. This is an untreated patient. This is a new diagnosis. He should initiate treatment with ADT as neoadjuvant therapy for con and then use local consolidation and targeted SBRT to bone metastases. He should get ADT with docetaxel or ADT with abiraterone for hormone-sensitive metastatic disease, or he should get a brain MRI to complete his staging. Um, in the interest of time and the lack of ARS, we will say this. So his treatment should include ADT and docetaxel or ADT and abiraterone. He has high volume metastatic disease, really a perfect opportunity to have a multidisciplinary discussion with the team and with the patient about whether we should use chemohormonal therapy, whether we should use ADT and abiraterone. This is not the setting where we would radiate the, the primary, but it's always nice if a radiation oncologist is in the room to just say, hey, he's got high volume metastatic disease. There is no benefit, at least in the stampede data, to radiating the primary, so we're not gonna do that, but we do have this clinical trial, so we could consider this opportunity, and that may be uh, a good one for your patient. So multidisciplinary care opportunities span the continuum of prostate cancer, um, and engaging a multidisciplinary team can enhance disease-specific outcomes if we're getting the right treatment to the right patient, can reduce morbidity and mortality, improve the quality of life if we're really doing the supportive care that we need to do. And it can identify risk factors for family members through genetic counseling um, to improve their care as well or potentially get opportunities for, for treatment for patients with more advanced disease. Besides that, it's actually a lot of fun. I, I think, you know, collaborating with our colleagues is one of the things that makes things so entertaining, so interesting, and helps us really do the best we can for our patients. So thank you guys for your time. Does anybody have any questions related to advanced prostate cancer? One of the guidelines recommends uh, testing for vitamin D in the advanced prostate cancer setting. Is that something that you incorporate into your practice? So, um, so, and I'm not sure which guideline. I don't think that the NCCN does, although perhaps it has, uh, perhaps it's changed. So I don't usually test for vitamin D, but I collaborate. I extend my multidisciplinary care to actually include primary care doctors. So I collaborate with primary care on um, uh, making sure that patients have vitamin D uh, assessments. I also ask them to monitor blood pressure and to uh, monitor hemoglobin A1C at least once a year for patients who are on ADT. I really engage with primary care to make sure that those kinds of risk factors that come from ADT alone are also uh, monitored. Um, and cholesterol management as well. So if a patient is actually high risk, I will often in engage actually with a cardio-oncologist uh, too, um, but trying to make sure that the multidisciplinary care doesn't necessarily need to stop with a urologist, med -onc and radiation oncologist. It can spread farther. Okay. Next, we'll uh, move our discussion to kidney cancer, which has also become uh, recently pretty complicated with results of clinical trials. So Brian Chook will be uh, discussing adjuvant treatments and multidisciplinary management of advanced uh, kidney cancer. Great. Thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> I'll be talking about kind of integration of systemic therapy and kidney cancer, but I'd like to say we also have a very team-focused approach in kidney. We have, you know, I have a clinic with a medical oncologist, and we have really team kidney. We have radiation oncologist. We have uh, IR folks. We have uh, nutritionists. We kind of work really closely in conjunction, and uh, I think it improves care. Um, Slides. Let me just go forward. Okay. Um, so we've got one question. First, uh, adjuvant therapy with this agent has shown to improve uh, improvement in overall survival. A um, couple options over here. And uh, if we do our ARS, if anyone has it. 
but we've had a bunch of agents uh, that have been tested in various settings. Uh, Vitaspan is a tumor vaccine, and uh, uh, the other one, obviously, okay, perfect. So uh, no agent has shown, uh, at least no one picked that, um, no agent has shown improvement in overall survival, which we'll get to. Um, the other question is, uh, which is not critical when considering the role of upfront cytoreductive nephrectomy? We have IMDC risk groups, that MD Anderson surgical criteria, the burden of disease, which can be debulked, the ability to do a minimally invasive approach, or the urgency of systemic therapy. Um, just answer that uh, uh, most of these are important. I'd say the ability to do a minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery, while potentially important to get a patient recovered, it really uh, should not be a, a, a major driver of um, deciding which approach to do. So we'll just skip over that. So we have a brief outline. Um, just going to run through quickly kind of the role of adjuvant therapy for our patients with high-risk disease. Um, really, we know who our bad actors are. These are patients that I had uh, operated on a couple years ago. Uh, one's a you know, high-level tumor thrombus into the heart. Uh, another one, uh, which was a tumor kind of going right into the porta hepatis uh, that was shaved off the liver. And both these patients recurred very quickly after. And uh, up until recently, really, the goal of surgery was to remove it. Put, it, uh, uh, put things in formalin and hope that patients never had any recurrence, but we knew that these patients did very poorly. Uh, a patient with T4 RCC, the risk of being alive at 10 years uh, is only about 10 percent. So again, we put things in formalin, we pray, nothing comes back, and that's really not a great option, uh, and it's not very satisfying when you do a really heroic surgery and you know your patient recurs. Um, we have many agents which have been tested. These are all our TKIs, um, and the ones in uh, red, um, you know, the uh, Ariser, which is a CI9 vaccine, Protect, Pazopinib, Atlas, Exitinib, the Assure, which is Serafinib, and Sutent, all those had uh, basically uh, been negative studies. Uh, the ones in white are still waiting for results. They were supposed to come out in 2018. They're delayed. Uh, uh, the Everest study, which is an mTOR inhibitor, should come out pretty soon, uh, maybe, maybe next year. They're trying to get the last couple of sites to send in their data. And the s track data is a little bit different, that it was more higher-risk patients. And we'll talk about it actually, I'll call that a tie rather than a win. Um, and this was the trial of 720 patients. Most of it was in Europe. And uh, how it was different than some of our other studies, it was only T3, it was only clear cell, and basically all the patients were uh, kept on 50 milligrams of Sutent versus uh, the Assure trial. The patients uh, had a lot of toxicity, and they amended the protocol to do 37 and a half. And there was a um, improvement in disease-free survival, but um, you know the definition of disease-free survival in this trial kind of gets lost. But it actually, one of the endpoints is actually development of a secondary can uh, cancer, which I, I feel is probably not relevant. And then if you look at the blue, uh, I was on the, the uh, uh, one of the panels where they practice going to ODAC for this drug, and there was really a different difference in uh, being lost to follow-up. A lot of patients were on Sutent, and then they just never showed up because they had toxicity. And you can feel closely, there's a lot more patients who are, um, who are basically censored in that group. But if you look at the overall survival, you can't get, you, this is actually two lines completely on top of each other. Um, and there was no improvement in overall survival. The, you know, Pfizer says, oh, we need more time, but we know that 90% of patients recur in the first two years, um, and the median survival of kidney cancer is, even with our great agents around that time, around 2010 to 2011, uh, the median survival was only two years. So you would probably have seen a difference in overall survival, uh, but this really has not been taken up in the community, um, and I, I think the rate of utilization in the U.S. is very poor. But the FDA did approve it, and uh, it is an option, and the NCCN guideline is just, it does say an option, but it still says preferred clinical trial or preferred observation. Um, but we have a lot going on. We have all these checkpoint inhibitors. We know that they're approved in the metastatic space. If they're able to uh, have a effect in a very advanced disease state, if there's a couple cells hiding, uh, you would think that they would have an effect. Uh, but we need to study this, and the four uh, trials are all a little bit different, but they're with a TISO, PEMBRO, or a NEVO, EPI. The a TISO study is fully accrued. Um, that was endorsed by the urology community very early in the, the, uh, the uh, clinical trial consortium through the SUO. Uh, the PROSPER study is the only one with a more of a, like a neoadjuvant approach, and those patients uh, are allowed in if they have potentially variant histologies. Um, I 
made this slide with Lauren Harshman, who I'm working on the trial. Basically, if you're going to train an immune cell with PD-1 to recognize a cancer cell, if you have a large primary tumor present, okay, you're going to be able to train the immune system to recognize a cancer. If you have one or two cells that are hiding, uh, the rationale of this approach is you're not going to be able to wake up the immune system and attack, attack or recognize the cancer. So we're very excited about this, and in, in a patient, uh, in, a, in a xenograft model, it actually uh, shows that patients who have the neo and adjuvant or sandwich immunotherapy approach, they do better. Uh, and this is kind of the schema where patients get a single dose of nivolumab before, they go to surgery and uh, have nine doses of Nevo after. Uh, this trial is actually struggling. There's only about 198 patients of the 800. It was supposed to be accrued by now, and it really is at risk of failing because the urology community hasn't really adopted this as a, a potentially alternative workflow. But we're hoping that that changes uh, with a couple of amendments. Um, in terms of the neoadjuvant kind of approach, well, we have all these drugs, TKIs, we've been using them since uh, December 2005 when the first drug was approved. Um, around that time, there was a lot of patients that were uh, getting these drugs that weren't candidates for surgery. And, you know, I wrote this kind of case, uh, basically a case series in 2008, which is really the first kind of description of patients who got these agents with the primary tumor in place. Uh, we were racing against our friends at Cleveland Clinic to get this story out. Uh, but basically, we said this is a new treatment paradigm where you can shrink tumor thrombi, you can downsize, make patients amenable to partial nephrectomy, or have kind of a litmus test. Um, and kind of since that kind of like hypothesis, there's been a lot of other studies which have kind of shown uh, the, this type of approach. Uh, and depending on the agent, depending on the population, how much is clear cell, uh, we do know tumors shrink. Really large, invasive, bulky tumors really don't really shrink enough to change management, but um, the but uh, there are kind of more the localized or locally advanced ones which potentially uh, may have a role in non-metastatic setting. And um, I'm just going to highlight two of these approaches. One from Brian Reaney at Cleveland Clinic. They looked at pizopinib and they really wanted to take really high-risk patients, solitary kidneys, really advanced. Uh, nephrometry uh, score cases, which were going to be very hard partials. And um, they had a, a, a lot of patients um, in that were partial nephrectomy was not going to be possible beforehand. Uh, about 46% uh, of them were kind of changed in their surgical parameters. Most of these were done by uh, Steve Campbell, and they were deemed that they were now amenable to a partial nephrectomy. Um, and here's just a resist response, 36%. But most patients it's an anti-angiogenic anti drug, and you kind of use an, uh, angi uh, uh, you kind of shrink the vessels. The tumor is going to have some response. Uh, there weren't dramatic changes. Surgeons are used to kind of using this nephrometry score, uh, but um, you know these patients did have uh, some small changes in the surgical parameters. Uh, with axitinib, this may be potentially even more potent uh, in terms of this type of approach. Um, uh, Jose Karam and Chris Wood looked at patients with axitinib uh, that were T2 or greater, and uh, this is actually a type of 44% resist response rate, and that most tumors um, did have shrinkage. Um, and um, was this enough to change surgical parameters? Well, the nephrometry score did go from 11 to 10, but there were a subset of patients where a panel of experts, he took some of uh, his friends, you know, Mo Alaf, um, he asked, uh, I think, uh, Phil Spice, a couple other uh, colleagues saying, is this now amenable to partial nephrectomy? And you see before and after, there were a lot of patients that uh, a panel of experts says, this is now amenable to partial nephrectomy. Um, so potentially, you know, if you have a patient who's high risk, this is off-label usage, but you could say someone is potentially non-resectable. You can give an agent, and it could potentially shrink or downsize. And I've done that, and I'll show a case later. Um, and if you have a, a good colleague, if you're not comfortable giving these agents, if you have a friend or partner, you can get your medical oncologist uh, to, to work with you and potentially do this type of integrated approach for these select patients. Uh, and th that... Um, uh, is being studied in a in a trial called Padres. Uh, Ethar Darish has uh, put forward a concept, several different sites that they'll be giving um, a pizopinib trying to uh, 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 change surgical parameters. And where does surgery fit in now in the advanced setting? Well, with all these drugs, we have a lot of new data. Do we do cytoreductive nephrectomies? Do we use these more effective drugs? Uh, I would tell you now in this setting, it's more than ever we need a multidisciplinary approach because you really shouldn't just be in your clinic kind of practicing on your own. Own, you need to have a kind of a coordinated discussion around all these high-risk patients. Um, but, you know, what's the role of surgery now? Well, what was it in, in before? Well, we did know in the immunotherapy uh, era, 
with the cytokine era that there was a benefit from taking out the primary tumor. And we've had two really well-designed randomized controlled trials. They were identical in EORTC or SWOG where patients actually had either interferon alpha or they had surgery followed by interferon alpha, which you can consider now almost a placebo because it's really a not very effective drug. Um, but looking at the meta-analysis, you basically improved your survival from um, eight months to 13.6, uh, which is a 31% reduction. Um, and this became the standard of care for de novo RCC, debulk the primary. However, what people fail to recognize is that this was still very selected patients. They didn't take patients with brain mets. They didn't take patients with really T4 disease, patients with really poor performance status. And I was fortunate when I was a resident to, to be involved in, in seeing who should not have had surgery. And at UCLA, when they were very pro IL-2, everyone went to surgery, whether they had sarcomatoid histology, they had brain meds that were treated, they had poor performance status, and patients didn't do very well. And 50% of the patients who probably shouldn't have had surgery never went on to receive systemic therapy. So if you're just going to be whacking kidneys out, you're, you're, uh, they're going to be patients who will not get to that uh, um, uh, uh, second line therapy to start uh, their systemic therapy. Um, and the MD Anderson group kind of quantified some of these variables together. Steve Culp with Chris Wood, they looked at about 400 patients. They put some of these variables together. And the, clearly, the more high-risk variables you got, the uh, worse the patients did. And if you really had a lot of high-risk features, you also were not going to get to the, the next line of systemic therapy, and you were potentially could be harmed by surgery. And surgery, again, um, uh, could, if not used correctly, uh, could definitely uh, be the wrong choice. Um, there are two kind of phase two trials that I thought were really kind of exciting the past couple of years um, uh, by Tom Powell's um, in uh, England where they use Sutan or Pizopinib and they basically in these patients with de novo disease, um, metastatic disease, seeing can we give these agents as a litmus test rather than racing off the surgery. These are clear cell RCC patients. They got about 10 to 16 weeks of, weeks of systemic therapy. What they did see is uh, in this cohort, um, we learned that patients with poor risk disease uh, from Tom's uh, studies, they did really poorly with surgery. If you had the IMDC, which is the International Metastatic uh, uh, Disease Criteria, which uh, Danny Hang and Tony Truery helped to kind of put, to put out there, it's really to risk stratify patients with metastatic RCC. It's not really to kind of select patients who are appropriate for surgery. But those patients do really badly with all systemic therapies um, versus uh, those with kind of a good risk disease. Uh, there are no good risk patients with de novo metastatic disease because one of the criteria is time to metastatic disease, and if it's less than 12 months, they really have one point. But what this did show that patients with poor risk disease, uh, only about 40% of them actually were surgical candidates after those 10 or 12 weeks, because patients who have poor risk disease, they progress. You take out their kidney or you give them systemic therapy, a lot of them are not going to do well. So patients who get this early litmus test with poor risk disease or they progress through those 10 to 12 weeks, don't take those patients to surgery. Um, and this kind of was later reinforced with a paper that came out this past year from Axel Beck uh, in, it's in JAMA Oncology. The study did not accrue very well, but the, this trial looks at patients who had this really well-characterized um, cytoreduction nephrectomy characteristics based on that MD Anderson criteria, and they randomized surgery versus sutent, sutent followed by surgery. If you progressed at that 12-week kind of point, you shouldn't go to surgery, kind of looking at that litmus, litmus test the primary endpoint was just looking at progression, and it was a negative study. There was no difference in progression, okay? But what was really exciting is that secondary endpoint, which is underpowered, but there is really a dramatic difference in overall survival in the deferred group, 32 versus 15 months. Um, and I would tell you that, again, while this is kind of more, it, it's not the primary endpoint, it's um, something that should raise thought that potentially giving systemic therapy, at least in the TKI era, especially borderline candidates um, in that poor risk group, potentially you could be harming patients. And I, I, what I see this data interpreted is that if you are taking the wrong patients to surgery, they are not going to go to get systemic therapy in the first line. By the time they progress through their first line therapy, maybe they're even worse off and they can't go to second line therapy. So I do think we kind of can prioritize systemic therapy and, uh, um, uh, um, and I think this is really thought, uh, thought provoking um, and I'm a little more cautious. If I know a patient's not going to be eligible for now, these new immunotherapy agents, uh, is it worthwhile starting someone on a TKI? Uh, I think there's really very little downside. 
Um, but the, you know, the elephant in the room is the Carmina study, and this is the study which was in New England Journal. And this was a really a great effort amongst the French centers to kind of work together and collaborate uh, between you know, the, the medical oncologist, the urologist, trying to see is cytodactyl nephrectomy even relevant with SUTENT. And rather, the, the CERT time was looking at the timing Okay, this is really looking at whether it's relevant is, is, uh, or should just be on SUTEMP. This was a non-inferiority endpoint. It wasn't looking to see if, if one was better. Um, it was 450 patients. They had a little trouble accruing over eight years at many, many, many centers. So there wasn't many high volume centers um, involved. So there were some criticisms, but this is still much larger than SWAG study much larger than the EORTC study. So when people can knock it and criticize it, at least it's level one data, and we did learn some valuable lessons. And at least in this group over here, um, we, we did see that SUTENT was not inferior to surgery and SUTENT. People said, oh, surgery is dead. We don't need to do cytoreductal nephrectomy. If you look very closely at the data, there are some flaws to this data, and they should be interpreted kind of very closely. Um, some of the issues is that the poor risk patients here, um, clearly we learned from Tom Powell's study that poor risk patients, they do really poorly, okay? And I think some of the reasons why it didn't accrue well is that a lot of these patients were cherry-picked, okay? The urologist was not going to really put a lot of the good, favorable candidates on this study, and really the worst of the worst probably went on this study. And if you saw that some of these patients actually, uh, if you, you know, number of metastatic sites, any one to five. I personally wouldn't operate on some with diffuse, widespread metastatic disease unless they were really symptomatic, and I'd call that really a palliative uh, nephrectomy rather than a really a, a really reducing to try to improve overall survival. So these we, they included a lot of poor surgical candidates. So then you take out the 450, you get rid of you know almost half of those patients. Still, in the forest plot, surgery still did not favor those that are in the intermediate risk. Again, it may be underpowered, um, but uh, it does raise food for thought that potentially not all our patients should benefit from cytoreductal nephrectomy. Uh, again, there's a nice editorial from Bob Mocher and Paul Russo. I mean, I would tell you that, again, you need to really have a thoughtful discussion on all patients. And the way we approach it now at UCLA is if a patient was a candidate for active surveillance, and active surveillance has been in metastatic disease, Brian Reaney, Dan and George, many medical oncologists have shown there are plenty of patients with metastatic disease that can be safely watched for several years if they have low volume disease, they're asymptomatic, the pace of disease is not growing. That's an ideal person to take out a large primary tumor. If they are symptomatic and their disease is not galloping as well, you could consider taking out their primary tumor. But anyone with advanced disease who has symptoms, you know, from their symptomatic sites, you should not rush off to surgery and it really, you know, you got to think about how you can help that patient overall with multiple members of the team. Ablating a site of disease, embolizing the tumor, starting on systemic therapy, uh, et cetera, or, or potentially starting on therapy and holding a nephrectomy down the road, depending on how they do. Um, how does this relate to the immunotherapy era now? Now, we don't give SUTEN first line anymore. It's been beaten even by cabozantinib. It's been beaten by ipinevo, avelumab, pembro, avel uh, uh, pembro, axitinib. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of different agents now which are better than SUTENT. So how are these relevant now? Well, in the immunotherapy, kind of the new era, the checkpoint inhibitor therapy era, we have probably more potent uh, uh, agents that potentially can cause even complete responses. Ipinevo, 9% complete response. Well, can we start using that and actually the big kidney tumor is going to disappear. Well, I'll tell you, it's probably not going to happen, but we have seen uh, one or two uh, um, you know, reports of pathologic responses in the primary tumor. These agents are better tolerated. There's less issue of what we call a rebound effect. If you, know, you block VEGF uh, receptor, your VEGF levels go up. You withdraw the drug, and you potentially can have rebound. In this, these agents like Nevo, you give it for once a month now. The half-life is very long. You don't have to worry about wound healing. You don't have to worry about uh, really significant perioperative morbidity or mortality, in at least in the melanoma and lung cancer world. Uh, I've been fortunate that while I was at Yale, my medical oncologists were like world experts in melanoma. They led a lot of the melanoma studies. So for many years, I was operating on patients uh, that had prior IPI, prior Nevo, and kidney. 
um, and they were using those patients in their phase one, phase two trials, and I never saw really any uh, uh, worse disease character, uh, uh, surgical characteristics. Uh, but how does this actually fit into the role in the cytoreductive nephrectomy era? Uh, well, I'll tell you, there is a major role, um, because if you look at our friends in lung cancer, uh, again, they show that there are significant responses, surgery is not more challenging, um, and it potentially patients can have improvement in outcome. So for in our field, there's been a couple studies proposed or ongoing that really have shown that this can be integrated into the surgical paradigm in either locally advanced or the metastatic setting. Uh, Jose Karam um, and Chris Wood had this study. Uh, they had about 100 patients, and it was a, a kind of a three-arm study, which was Nevo, Nevo Bev, and Nevo Ipi. I think BEV is not a good agent ever to be studied in the perioperative setting. The half-life is 28 days. There's issues with wound healing. Yes, you know, it could be potentially synergistic. There's a tezo bev There's some data. There's some synergy. But we have better agents that target the, the, uh, the VEGF pathway. Uh, but they looked at this, and this was presented at ASCO last year. There is about a 1% uh, complete response rate. So, you know, I don't know whether those patients should go to surgery, but those were patients who still had lesions, but they were pathologic complete responses, which which is really fascinating. We've never seen that before. Um, in our SWAG uh, committee, this has been put forth. It was finally given a number. Um, this is taking patients that were going to will either go to ipinevo followed by surgery versus ipinevo uh, alone. I would tell you that um, you know the, the SWAG committee, which led the initial cytoreductive nephrectomy uh, trials, um, the Bob Flanagan study, they're still thought that cytoreductive nephrectomy may be of benefit, but uh, you know this is potentially giving ipinevo up front. I do have concerns that these are going to be poor, some of these are going to be poor risk patients, and I kind of, if patients are going to be put on, I, I, in good faith, I don't know if I would put a patient with poor risk disease on this trial knowing that they do very poorly, and if they get randomized to the surgery arm, even with a good response, a lot of them probably aren't going to be eligible for a nephrectomy unless they have a really good response. Um, so the case studies, I have two case studies, how I use these agents and, you know, potentially, uh, you know, did patients benefit. Well, the first case is a 63-year-old gentleman who had a two-centimeter renal mass. He had a right atrophic kidney, creatinine of 1.7. Uh, another doctor biopsied it. It was a clear cell grade one. They said, don't worry about it. You know, you come once every couple of years. He was placed on surveillance. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the lesion grew. So it was about 5.5 by 5.7 centimeters. It was nephrometry. You know, I had actually my resident said it was 11. I said it was a 10. So I would say 10 versus 11. Um, and this patient really, you know, that's a tough surgery. Um, it's right on the vein. It's completely endophytic. Um, something like that, um, you know, you can definitely lose a kidney or you can definitely devascularize a large chunk of that kidney. Um, so I gave that guy axidinib in my own clinic. It's off-label use, so I would tell you, you know, it's something that is not in the real clear guidelines. The lesion shrunk to 3.7 centimeters. The resist uh, change was 33%. Nephrometry, you know, did go to a 9. I stopped at 72 hours, just showing the lesion has changed. Again, it's still in a tough location, but it now is potentially above the polar line. Um, I would tell you, in that, in my hands, um, you know, I could have done that robotically, but I did that uh, open, I did that off clamp with no ischemic time. I didn't mind losing a liter of blood. I just put my finger on the whatever's pumping. Um, and that patient uh, had a segmental renal vein um, uh, uh, thrombus. We took it out, and it was T3 grade 2 negative margins, the creatinine 1.8, disease free two years out. Um, he didn't like that accident. Did I think it made a difference? I, I did. Uh, the tumor was smaller. Um, um, you know, if I had done it up front, would it have made a difference? I don't know. We need to move forward if we're going to do some type of randomized trial in that, but we're not there yet. Uh, and this is that study I mentioned that uh, ETHAR is leading. Um, uh, a couple centers are doing that to try to see if we can uh, expand this approach. Um, I don't like the Padres acronym because I'm a Yankee fan, but uh, he's from San Diego, so he put that up. Uh, so this is another final case. A young man, 45, came to my clinic with his two autistic children in the clinic. It was a really, really kind of very difficult situation. They had very little family support. This guy said, I need to do whatever I can to be around for my kids. I can't leave my wife alone in this uh, difficult situation. He had a large renal mass, um, about 10 centimeters, and he had these nodes. This one, para, uh, kind of pre-cavel and inter cavel, and there's that one right behind the left renal vein, about two centimeters inter cavel. 
this guy, you know, one of the things, he's young, I, I was worried maybe he could have a translocation, maybe he could have, you know, some other variant histology. I actually got germline testing, I expedited it, I do the germline testing myself for kidney, um, and he actually tested negative for everything. We got a, like about a 10-day turnaround, we rushed it. I was worried he could have, you know, HLRCC, could have something. Uh, I enrolled him on the PROSPER study um, while I was at Yale, um, and uh, basically this study is neoadjuvant, one dose of NEVO. Uh, he was randomized um, to the NEVO arm, uh, I was for, happy about. The PERC biopsy showed high-grade clear cell. Uh, back then it was two doses of NEVO, and then now it's only one. Surgery was performed. We cleaned out all his lymph nodes. I went a little crazy, and uh, he developed chylocystitis, needed a drain for a couple of weeks. 10 centimeter mass, unclassified. So any of the ca current trials we have now, um, the uh, TISO, the PEMBRO, the uh, uh, NEVO IPI studies, he would have not been eligible for any of these studies. But because he was on the PROSPER study, and because they allow patients who have varian histologies, you know, he was able to get on this 10 of 15 nodes. I can't say he would have done any different. He's now, he's NED 17 months out. Um, I, I would assume that that guy would have probably recurred, but, um, you know, again, we have to wait for the trial to see if it is, um, you know, changing the overall outcome, but I haven't seen many patients with 10 to 15 nodes that actually um, remain NED that far out, so I, I'm really happy for him, but, um, again, I'm hoping that we can get more data, so if you guys don't have Prosper open at your centers, please talk to me. We'd love to make it happen. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions quickly? So just as a housekeeping, um, everybody should receive an evaluation after this. We're uh, more than happy to accept the good and the bad. We're interested in making this a better talk e each year. Uh, and then each evaluation also places you uh, in for a drawing for free registration for the 2020 meeting of the AUA. So please uh, help us from that perspective. Next up will be Kelvin Moses. He'll be looking at a multidisciplinary care for metastatic gastro-resistant prostate cancer, specifically looking at immunotherapy, bone-targeted agents, and also advanced anti-androgen agents. Thank you. Thanks to Kelly for putting this together. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Raise up on your toes. All right, sit down. Good. No, right. Urology yoga. <laughs> yeah. Okay. These are my disclosures. That's how you use the system. Here's our question. So first question, 72-year-old man has been on Lupron for six years for biochemical recurrence after uh, radiation for intermediate risk prostate cancer. PSA rose from 0.18 to 3 over a two-year period and imaging uh, confirmed multi -bony, multiple bony lesions as well as lymph node metastasis, but he's in good condition. He has class two heart failure and hypertension, which is moderately managed with spironolactone, amlodipine, losartan. Which of the following would not be a recommended for this patient? CYP1720 lyase inhibitor, tubulin binding agent, second generation antiandrogen, vitamin D and calcium. And um, so we'll move forward with that. Um, so the answer is a CYP1720 lyase inhibitor, which is abiraterone. Next question, 56-year-old man received brachytherapy for Gleason 8 disease in 2015. His nadir uh, was uh, high, greater than 2, and was started on androgen deprivation soon after. His PSA was detectable initially, but then rose to 1.2 March of 2018, and then 2 in July 2018, which is not an appropriate next step for him. Obtain DEXA scan, start vitamin D calcium, obtain CTM bone scan, administer immunotherapy. Good, we shorten the time. So uh, administer immunotherapy. So CPLUCLT. Uh, would not be given in, in this patient. So objectives for this uh, presentation, understand the clinical guidelines for immunotherapy, and uh, particularly cipulosal T. 
discuss second generation oral antiandrogens, incorporation of radium-223 therapy in the appropriate patient populations, and then develop a framework for multidisciplinary care of patients with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer <laughs> based on the AUA guidelines. Here's a, a, a well-used figure, just shows the natural progression of prostate cancer. 77% of patients are identified with localized disease. They receive some type of treatment. Uh, anywhere from 30 to 60% of patients will have biochemical recurrence, which is usually treated with androgen deprivation. Most patients will respond, but a significant percentage of patients will become castrate resistant over time and within that time develop metastasis. Castrate resistance is defined by uh, three categories, a continuous rise in PSA, progression of pre-existing disease, or appearance of new metastasis while on androgen deprivation. Here's a shrunken down version of the AUA guidelines for metastatic CRPC. These are actually already out of date, but it's a good uh, representation of the type of patients and the options for each one of them. So beginning with immunotherapy, I had a patient uh, a few years ago, 61-year-old black man who had surgery in 2012 for Gleason 8 disease. He did have a positive margin, but did nadir to undetectable levels. Uh, however, the next year, his PSA went up to 3.5, and his imaging was negative. So he was started on androgen deprivation and remained undetectable until April 2014 when his PSA was 5. He was asymptomatic, but his repeat imaging showed the lesion that you can see here in the spine. And so he is what we what is considered index patient two on the AUA guidelines. And those patients are asymptomatic with uh, metastatic disease. And their options include abiraterone with prednisone, enzalutamide, cipulucil T, and docetaxel. I'll focus on cipulucil T right now. Uh, the FDA approved this for asymptomatic metastatic CRPC with a, a reasonable life expectancy. Side effects are usually relatively manageable and uh, flu-like symptoms associated with immune uh, reinfusion. There are rare stroke and thrombotic complications associated. Poor candidates include those who have symptomatic disease, rapidly progressive disease, meaning a short PSA doubling time, limited life expectancy, and possibly visceral metastasis. This is how it works. So our, uh, the patients uh, get leukophoresis, usually at an American Red Cross or an approved center. These leukocytes are then sent out. They're activated by uh, GMCSF and also labeled with uh, the prostatic acid phosphatase fusion protein. And so what are normally quiescent cells are activated and then reinfused in the patient. And this occurs three times. And the mechanism is that you have upregulation of uh, uh, cytokines in response to the uh, fu fusion protein on the activated lymphocytes. You have CD8 T cell activation, which causes prostate tumor cell lysis. Uh, we saw this data already from uh, the uh, uh, IMPACT trial showing an improvement of approximately four months and a 22% reduction in death, risk of death on cell T. Unfortunately, there is no radiographic or PSA response, and so I uh, believe some of the hesitation in uptake of cell T was based on this because both the patient and physician rely on these type of markers in order to determine the progression of disease. There is uh, data that uh, supports early use of cell T. So in the, in the trial, all patients, all comers, PSAs range from less than two to, you know, in the thousands. However, in the impact trial, there was a 22% reduction of risk of death and independent prognostic factors for survival included PSA, LDH, ALKFOS, uh, performance status, and visceral metastasis. And so the investigators looked at the data in terms of PSA quartiles. And as you can see here, the quartiles were PSA of less than 22, 22 to 50, 50 to 134, and greater than 134. And what you see here, the hazard ratios differ according to the PSA level. And in the lowest quartile, PSA of less than 22, the hazard ratio is 0.51, and this is significant. The next highest quartile, the 26% uh, reduction in death, did not reach statistically significant 
Um, this was not a power trial. This was a review of their existing data. So it was not power to uh, detect survival, but these were the signals that were found. These were not randomized as well, but it does suggest that earlier treatment for, with Cipulusil T appears to have a, the uh, greatest survival benefit. Because of these findings, the FDA went back to Dendrion and uh, asked for basically phase four data. And so the PROCE registry was a real world um, in, uh, a registry of patients uh, who received Cipulusil T in the community over a two year period. Notably, they enrolled 12% African-American patients, which is unusual for clinical trials. It's normally 3 to 4%. And so it allowed for prospective examination based on ethnicity. Uh, an analysis, they looked at Caucasian versus black patients in a 2 to 1 ratio matched by baseline PSA. And they estimated overall survival and independent factors associated with this. The groups were relatively similar, performance status, hemoglobin, and uh, receipt of prior local therapy or chemotherapy were slightly different, uh, statistically different, but otherwise similar groups. And as you can see here, uh, all patients with a PSA of less than 7.5 had a survival benefit. However, African American patients had an even greater survival difference of 17 months compared to white patients. The overall hazard ratio here indicates a 50, 56% uh, reduction, uh, reduction in risk of death. And even in the next quartile, up to 20, PSA of 27, uh, again, all patients had a uh, survival benefit, 40% 40, 40 reduction in risk of death, but black men had an uh, even greater benefit of 14.8 months. Uh, there were uh, higher differences in, in the higher quartiles. However, these did not reach statistically significant. And so this patient uh, that I just uh, presented earlier received Cipulus OT. He did well. His PSA actually remained relatively stable and then rose from 3.8 to 6.5. He had interval development of uh, bony disease and pelvic lymphadenopathy and was mildly symptomatic with back pain related to his scan. And so this leads into the second generation, oh, sorry, second line oral antiandrogen therapies. Uh, this patient, uh, uh, is in index two, still minimally symptomatic. Uh, and so the oral therapies available include abiraterone with prednisone as well as enzalutamide. Abiraterone acetate was FDA approved for in metastatic CRPC before or after chemotherapy, and I'll discuss the trials in a second. Common side effects include worsening hypertension, hypokalemia, fatigue, and steroid-induced hyperglycemia. And therefore, patients who do not tolerate this uh, medication well are those who cannot tolerate steroids, uh, who have brittle diabetes, or rapidly progressive disease. So a bit of the mechanism of action, I don't want to belabor uh, adrenal physiology unless you're doing your recertification. But uh, as we know, the pregnenolone is the, um, the source factor, uh, which is uh, responsive to ACTH production. You see here the 17-alpha hydroxylase and uh, CYP1720 lyase uh, eventually help with production of aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone. Obviously, we want to block testosterone. However, in doing that, you raise levels of ACTH due to feedback of reduced aldosterone and cortisol, and those uh, uh, create the side effects that we just discussed. And therefore, those patients need to be on mineralocorticoid with prednisone. Uh, the Cougar trial was the seminal trial uh, showing overall survival benefit with a 25% re uh, reduction in risk of death uh, with abiraterone uh, versus prednisone alone, and also improvement in radiographic progression-free survival. Enzalutamide is another FDA-approved medication, again, approved in uh, pre- and post-chemotherapy settings. Common side effects include hypertension, fatigue, constipation, diarrhea, and rarely seizures. Uh, it is uh, contraindicated in patients with prior history of seizure. Uh, and additionally, there are some warnings about patients who have uh, or on uh, seizure threshold lowering medications. The mechanism, mechanism of action is a little bit different from bicalutamide in that it has three levels of action. Um, it, uh, it blocks the binding of testosterone to the androgen receptor. Uh, 
It also blocks uh, the uh, cytosol uh, translocation uh, into the cytosol as well as uh, nuclear translocation and transcription. In addition, it does not have the partial agonist activity that bicalutamide has over prolonged treatment. The PREVAIL trial was uh, investigating men pre-chemotherapy who received enzalutamide versus placebo. There's a, a two-month uh, survival benefit and 29% risk uh, reduction in the risk of death. So our patient chose enzalutamide, uh, and he was on this for actually two years, and was uh, uh, PSA was undetectable. After about 28 months, he had an elevated PSA of 2.5, and he was switched to abiraterone, uh, which worked for about six months, but he uh, had a steady rise in his PSA. Repeat bone scan now was a super scan. Uh, he had stable lymph lymphadenopathy, but now was uh, symptomatic in multiple sites. And so this leads into a discussion about the utilization of radium-223 in patients with bony disease. As you remember from your chemistry class in high school, uh, families on the periodic table are on vertical, and uh, calcium and radium are within the same family uh, with the alkali earth metals. It is a bone-seeking isotope that mimics calcium and co uh, complexes with hydroxyapatite in osteoblastic lesions. These are, uh, it is an alpha emitter and causes double-stranded breaks in the DNA. This, too, has been FDA approved for men and met with metastatic CRPC with symptomatic metastases before or after chemotherapy. Side effects are usually relatively toler well tolerated. It's more uh, um, related to suppression of uh, bone marrow. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can happen, and very rarely can see refractory cytopenias. Poor candidates are those with bone marrow dysfunction, uh, particularly those who had a rough a rough go with prior chemotherapy, as well high volume visceral disease. The trial uh, that led to approval for radium was the Alsimca trial. This was phase three international, randomized two to one with six monthly treatments of radium-223 versus placebo, uh, looking at overall survival and time to symptomatic skeletal related events. It was well tolerated and there were similar uh, rates of grade three to four complications. Here's the um, Kaplan-Meier curve showing this. There was a 30% reduction in risk of death and improvement in survival approximately three months. And this is, uh, uh, this sounds like a modest response, but again, these are high volume uh, disease patients with symptomatic bony lesions. And there was plenty of data that actually showed you could have improvement or even resolution of these bony metastases. You may remember that Samarium-153 was an option for a similar um, uh, group of patients. And when you compare, compare Alsemca with uh, the uh, Samarium trial, um, these patients uh, uh, in Alsemca was radium alone versus placebo, whereas uh, Samarium was, uh, uh, well, they compared Samarium with docetaxel versus estramustine. Uh, median survival in our Simca groups 14.9 months versus 29 months, um, and PSA progression was 3.6 versus uh, 6 months. Toxicities uh, in our Simca trial, the main one is uh, thrombocytopenia, and uh, in samarium uh, grade 4 neutropenia. 25% improvement in quality of life in the al trial, radium-223, and then 60% pain response in those who receive samarium. Uh, there has been some uh, work looking at uh, combined therapy with radium-223 and concomitant enzalutamide or abiraterone. This is a phase three early access open label trial. Median survival uh, of 16 months, uh, however, 5% of patients did have serious adverse events uh, due to treatment. And so to, to uh, put a bow on this, just a multidisciplinary approach, uh, in our clinic at Vanderbilt and, and others that have replicated it, we do have multiple members. Obviously, you want a urologic oncology focused uh, provider, uh, not provider, I hate that word, urologist, uh, medical oncology. Uh, we do utilize a nurse practitioner in our clinic, uh, and they need to be familiar with the guidelines, familiar with side effects, 
understand uh, PSA doubling time calculation as well as the imaging uh, requirements. We have a specialty pharmacy which is really helpful. Uh, they call the patients every month to find out how they're doing. The medications are mailed to these patients. They uh, investigate any drug-drug interactions, and they also interact with the uh, companies to get discounts or vouchers for medication. So that's, that's been really helpful. Uh, you need an apheresis location. In Nashville, we have an American Red Cross right around the corner. Uh, but we do draw from a very large rural population from Kentucky, uh, southern Illinois, southern Indiana, northern Alabama. Uh, and, uh, but the company has partnered with apheresis sites uh, in all these areas, so patients can still get this, particularly if they have access to an infusion center. And then lastly, uh, radiation oncology and nuclear medicine, they help with the calculation of dosing for uh, radium-223, as well as uh, spot welding for patients who have uh, metastatic, symptomatic metastatic sites, particularly in precarious locations. So in summary, patients with MCRPC have multiple options. Uh, most are relatively well tolerated. Patients are able to maintain quality of life, though optimal sequence has not been determined. However, uh, early utilization of Cipulosa T should be considered based on the uh, proceed data, particularly in black men. Uh, there are no existing data regarding the efficacy of combined, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, enzalutamide versus abiraterone as a first therapy. Uh, and I'll add also as a combined therapy. I know, I think one of the arms of the, um, what's the British trial? Um, Stampede. Yeah, Stampede, they are doing combined therapy. And then uh, radium-223 improves survival in men with bone predominant disease. Thank you. Any questions about advanced prostate cancer care? Certainly being a, a member of a multidisciplinary team has the uh, rewarding component of seeing a patient throughout the spectrum of care. And I think as you work together and kind of tackle issues as a team, that becomes uh, something that kind of stimulates you to keep working harder to create that uh, multidisciplinary setting. I just had a quick question for Kelvin. So I, I actually had the good fortune of working with Kelvin for a number of years at Vanderbilt. Um, and I find that one of the, one of the challenges, if, if you don't integrate a multidisciplinary care approach from the beginning, I think that the handoffs from, from one stage of prostate cancer through that continuum can become increasingly stressful for patients because um, I've definitely had patients who came to me and said, well, aren't you the angel of death, and, which I love <laughs> as a medical oncologist. But um, you know that, that, that transition is stressful in, in any event, but to transition from one provider completely to another provider can actually add to that. And so I was just curious how you how, how you view that, and if you think the multidisciplinary approach from an earlier stage may ease that sort of emotional stress. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think the two benefits, number one, with the team approach, they're familiar with everybody. They're getting all the options. And the second thing is I think they trust the conclusion more because it's not just one person saying this is what has to be done. They know that they had a room full of experts, they discussed it, everybody uh, put their eyes on it. So I think there are at least those two benefits, if not more, um, and it keeps patients, again, from feeling like, well, you know, I've been handed off and, you know, that's the end, even when they still have options. That definitely seems to be the case. So our, our last talk is uh, bladder cancer, and uh, I'll be talking about new adjuvant chemotherapy, the adjuvant treatment for high-risk pathology, and then immunotherapy and metastatic bladder cancer. Um, these are my disclosures, and we do have an audience response question that we can quickly run through. So it's a 67-year-old gentleman, had a history of muscle invasive bladder cancer, and underwent cystectomy. At the time of the diagnosis, he had declined new adjuvant chemotherapy due to concern for side effects. His pathology showed one out of seven lymph nodes positive for cancer. And so the next step would be A, observation with early repeat imaging, B, pelvic radiation therapy, C, adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy, D, referral for immunotherapy, or E, adjuvant carboplatin chemotherapy. <laughs> 
let this run through. Uh, this question, certainly there's an opportunity for a difference of opinion um, and, and differing strategies for how to manage this patient. So we had a referral for immunotherapy, and I think that that's something you could consider, especially if the patient wasn't eligible for cisplatin-based chemotherapy. From my perspective, I felt like adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy would be the next best step. And, uh, and I think this question highlights the fact that a multidisciplinary uh, team can help ensure patients get the most ideal treatment, which in this setting would be based on level one evidence for new adjuvant chemotherapy. And so, um, you know, really, when you're looking at uh, bladder cancer, you, it's critical to have uh, multiple team members evaluate a patient. I, I suspect that this, this patient, probably their concern for side effects was predicated on a urologist's uh, vision of what it's like to have new adjuvant chemotherapy. And medical oncologists may offer a perspective that would have swayed this patient towards new adjuvant chemotherapy. So here are our objectives. Uh, looking at the multidisciplinary approach to muscle invasive disease, evaluating the role of new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, the benefit of chemotherapy after cystectomy, and then looking at adjuvant therapies, including immunotherapy. So this is a, a classic study from Stein showing uh, survival after cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer. And what you see is that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. So uh, patients who had extra, extra vesicle or lymph node uh, involvement they had very poor survival long term. Uh, recurrence free survival of the five year range was something like 40 to 60 percent. So, um, cystectomy alone is, is not the ideal treatment for these patients. And what I really want to try to present is, is that good chemotherapy matched with good surgery is the ideal treatment. Uh, and so, these are the studies looking at the role of new adjuvant therapy. On the left is the ERTC trial, and on the right is the SWOG 8710 trial. So when you look at it, the EORTC trial, there, the hazard ratio was 0.86, so representing 16% uh, improvement that was, clinic, that was uh, significant, and there was even long-term follow-up that showed that. Um, interestingly, in this study, this European study, the treatment included cystectomy, radiation therapy, and then also even radiation therapy plus cystectomy, and then looking at new adjuvant, uh, plus or minus new adjuvant therapy in both of the, in all those groups. And so um, I think most people would consider that cystectomy would be a preferential treatment for patients as opposed to radiation therapy. And you do see the benefit of cystectomy and chemotherapy in the patients who underwent cystectomy. Their hazard ratio was only 0.74 representing an even, uh, an even greater improvement with new adjuvant chemotherapy in that group. In the SWOG trial, uh, it looked at MBAC and at a five-year uh, rate, uh, the overall survival improvement was 14%, and that was also significant. So uh, both of these trials uh, illustrate to us the potential benefits of new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, we don't want to uh, uh, create a scenario where new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy is felt to be the only requirement because good surgery is also very important as well. And so on the left is the Harry Herr's data of the 8710 uh, trial looking at uh, lymph node uh, dissection and then uh, also survival based off of that. So the best patients were patients who had greater than 10 lymph nodes removed, which is a surrogate for surgical quality and had no, lymph, uh, no positive lymph nodes. Uh, and then the worst patients were patients who had a positive lymph node with an inadequate resection, represented as less than 10 lymph nodes in the lymph node dissection. And so what you see in this uh, data is the, starting to tease out the potential uh, interplay between chemotherapy and radiation in these bladder cancer patients. And although this wasn't uh, ultimately published, this was an abstract that was presented at ASCO um, where they looked at and stratified patients in the same trial dependent upon whether they received new adjuvant chemotherapy and then also whether or not they had a lymph node count greater than 10. And so what you, what you see here at the top are patients who had new adjuvant chemotherapy, cystectomy, and lymph nodes greater than 10. And their five-year overall survival was 81%. They were by far the best. 
for patients who didn't get chemotherapy but had, a, had an adequate lymph node dissection rep representing uh, quality surgery, their survival dropped to 66%. And then if a patient didn't have uh, chemotherapy and also had a poor lymph node dissection, by far they, they, their decline in survival, 39%. So uh, it really shows you that interplay between uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and then adequate surgery. So we don't want to get away from, uh, from understanding the importance of both. And, and I think that that just builds a stronger multidisciplinary team when you recognize the significance of each. This is the new uh, the meta-analysis for new adjuvant chemotherapy. And then you see uh, here that 5% uh, survival benefit on the whole. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that some patients uh, up here were treated with single agent and, and that just isn't going to work. So it, it requires a combined uh, new adjuvant chemo regimen. And again, this is that five-year improvement in survival at five years. And so from the perspective of a uh, multidisciplinary team, uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy has level one evidence showing survival benefit. And this is, in fact, the, uh, the AUA guidelines. And it's a joint AUA, ASCO, ASTRO, and SUO guidelines, the most collaborative guideline of all the AUA guidelines. Uh, and so um, really harping on that multidisciplinary approach. It's unique that they literally put that in the center to ensure that patients get the most ideal treatment, that new adjuvant chemotherapy, and then surgery to follow. Now, if a patient did not undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy but had high-risk pathology after cystectomy, they may be a candidate for adjuvant chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the adjuvant studies have had a lot of problems. So the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy would be that you only select the patients who may benefit the most. So if a patient had T2 disease and uh, didn't have any positive lymph nodes, maybe they could avoid chemotherapy, whereas if they had uh, uh, a perivesical fat invasion or maybe a positive lymph node, then you would give them chemotherapy. Uh, the trials for this have had a lot of difficulty accruing. And, uh, and we know that patients after cystectomy have a number of other issues that they have to contend with, and so the treatment also has been challenging. Uh, the, these uh, studies showed a potential benefit, but not that level one evidence uh, for adjuvant treatment. This is probably the biggest study, the ERTC study, uh, which um, again, it showed uh, non-significant overall survival benefit, uh, but a potentially significant uh, 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 recurrence-free survival benefit. Now, if you look at patients and you stratify by them by whether or not they had positive lymph nodes, then you see that the patients who had negative lymph nodes seem to have a survival benefit with adjuvant chemotherapy. And so, in my mind, I would look at this and say, well, this at least tells us that a patient who has high-risk pathology, even if they didn't have lymph nodes positive, they may benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Unfortunately, patients who had positive lymph nodes, we don't pick up that signal. And some of that may have been uh, based upon the populations that they were looking at, the fact that they had difficulty accruing, the fact that uh, it would be hard for me personally to put somebody on a trial with positive lymph nodes and and think that they may not receive adjuvant chemotherapy. So uh, we see that these trials have been hampered by the fact that growing enthusiasm for new adjuvant chemotherapy has led us to more and more uh, push chemotherapy. And so a patient who didn't have it in a new adjuvant setting, you could consider cisplatin-based chemotherapy, uh, and there's a potential that that may help. The key to what we've been discussing is that cisplatin uh, framework for new, ad for new adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy. The problem is, and in particular the bladder cancer setting, many patients are either uh, on the border or not candidates for cisplatin. Making it even more complicated for the urologist is who is cisplatin eligible? Um, it's difficult for a urologist to accurately assess that. And so working together with your medical oncologist, it's important to understand what their thoughts are. And, and 
one thing to consider is, is that each medical oncologist may have a different perspective. So this was a, a group of uh, oncologists who came together to try and clarify what represents a cisplatin eligible versus ineligible patient. And you can see their discordance. So uh, for instance, creatinine clearance, at what level would it be 60? Well, 41% felt that. Would it be 50? Well, 33% uh, felt that they could go that low. Some even felt they could go lower. Age, should that be a way to stratify? The majority felt like probably not, but some were concerned that as patients increase in age, they should not undergo cisplatin chemotherapy. Obviously, performance status is important, and you can see that there's kind of an increasingly increasing reluctance as performance status declines. And then comorbidities too. You, many of the patients that we see with bladder cancer have concurrent medical uh, comorbidities, and so considering those and whether or not the patient can receive chemotherapy is very important. In the metastatic setting, uh, in general, patients uh, receive chemotherapy either MBAC or uh, GEMCIS. And so these are some of the early studies where they compared MBAC versus gemcitabine cisplatin. And so you can see that in this study, the uh, results were very similar. And so basically this built the framework for using GEMCIS in the metastatic setting. And, uh, and then as you move forward, dose-dense MBAC became an option. So this showed uh, uh, an improvement in progression-free and overall survival that appeared to be present with dose-dense MBAC. And so dose-dense MBAC and GEMCIS are now the preferential treatments for metastatic uh, bladder cancer. It's important to consider that patients may become candidates for uh, surgery with metastatic bladder cancer. And so um, this is a study from Harry Herr's group where they looked at patients who were complete responders to chemotherapy and then had a uh, shift from unresectable or metastatic disease to potentially resectable. And they found 29 patients who looked like they had a great response to chemotherapy. And they even thought that they may be completely resectable. And so they underwent cystectomy. Now, uh, what my point is here is, is that there were uh, 29 patients who had residual disease, uh, 15 in the bladder and 19 in the lymph nodes. But at five years, 30% uh, uh, of them were still alive. So there's a potential uh, ability to gain survival benefit with surgery. And that's something that you may work together to define who that uh, optimal candidate is. So for locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer, first line treatment would be either dose dense MVAC or gemcitabine and cisplatin. For uh, the cisplatin ineligible patient, uh, there is carboplatin as a potential option. And then second line treatments we'll look at here in just a second. So uh, in that uh, recent time frame, there has been a growth of immunotherapy in bladder cancer, and specifically for the second line treatment uh, with both uh, atizolizumab, uh, the uh, pembrolizumab, and then more recently, duralumab and abelumab. So we'll look at some of this. Uh, for locally advanced and metastatic bladder cancer, cisplatin ineligible, uh, here are basically the response rates. And it, for me, conceptually, it was good to see this all in one graph. If they're cisplatin eligible, this is, uh, this is showing dose dense MVAC, uh, partial response, complete response uh, added on. So up to 70% of patients will have some response. This is GEMSYS. I'm not sure that you can necessarily compare the two uh, one for one, but certainly up to 50% of patients will have a response. In cisplatin ineligible patients, this is Jim Carbo, and then this is pembrolizumab and atizolizumab. We know that uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about immunotherapy uh, as a second line treatment. And uh, more recently, we've kind of stratified that as patients either receiving Jim Carbo or pembrolizumab. There's been a little bit less enthusiasm about atizolizumab after recent trials and updates. So this is atizolizumab. It was the first immunotherapy approved uh, for advanced bladder cancer. And uh, so both in the setting for patients who've had uh, prior cisplatin treatment, so a second line, and then also those who are cisplatin ineligible. Uh, now, more recently, there's been data and the FDA has changed uh, the tune that patients who would receive atizolizumab 
should either have PDL1 testing positive or should be uh, ineligible for all platinum agents. And so there's a little bit of a debate as to what the platinum ineligible patient looks like versus the patient who may be ineligible for any treatment at all. And then pembrolizumab, uh, which was approved for second line therapy and then also the cisplatin ineligible patients. Now, as opposed to atizolizumab, pembrolizumab actually has data showing a potential benefit as second line as compared to chemotherapy. And so it's the preferential immune therapy agent in that setting. And then PDL1 testing is now uh, a FDA requirement for some patients who are looking at second line treatment. And so in the Invigor 210 uh, trial, the Ventana assay was used for atezolizumab. In the Keno trial, the DACO uh, test was used for uh, uh, pembrolizumab. So uh, these are our uh, diagnostic tests that would be required to assess for PDL1 uh, status prior to using these in the second line. And then finally, there's also been approval for nivolumab, durvalumab, and avalumab, and all of these are also in the second line setting. So uh, the expansion of immunotherapy has been important for all the bladder cancer patients, but it's also important from the multidisciplinary setting because urologists, medical oncologists, and primary care providers, in addition to ER doctors, we know that these patients will frequently visit your clinic or the ER with some issues. It's important to recognize the adverse events from immunotherapy to make sure that we treat these patients appropriately. So for instance, a patient who uh, may have metastatic bladder cancer who hasn't necessarily undergone a cystectomy could come with uh, complaints of a urinary tract infection or fever. You may be uh, isolated on that and not recognize that the patient could have uh, colitis or an inflammatory pneumonitis and that that may be the uh, side effect of the immunotherapy. And it's important to work with the medical oncologist uh, who's helping manage the immunotherapy to make sure that you don't miss something. I know, for instance, I had a patient, an elderly gentleman, who um, had congestive heart failure, and his family thought that he was having an episode of congestive heart failure. And in the ER, they worked him up as congestive heart failure, started giving him Lasix, and, uh, you know, I talked to them about making sure that he doesn't have a pneumonitis as well. And so uh, it, it, the medical oncologist had no idea that the patient was in the hospital because it, the communication to my clinic was the only, uh, the, only, it, the only person that anybody thought to talk to. So I had to kind of go back and get the medical oncologist involved and then make sure the hospitalist was involved and the ER doctors were involved. So there can be a tremendous amount of uh, coordination of care that's required for patients who are on immunotherapy. And so I think that that's the end of the talk and the end of our session. Does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you for coming. Certainly consider uh, offering an evaluation. We would appreciate that.